Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Louisa. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe. And if you're coming back, welcome back. And today's video, I wanted to talk about boundaries and why some people can't see them. It's not necessarily that they don't want to see them or that they have ill intentions towards other people and therefore willfully trample their boundaries. Some people just literally cannot see them. So if this is a subject that interests you, there is also a blog post which I wrote about this subject and I will link it in the description box so you can check that out. But the conversation was kind of started when I was talking to my dad earlier on this week and he was talking about his dad. And my father always talks about his father in very positive terms. He never has anything bad to say about his dad or the way that his dad raised him. And his dad actually raised him alone. Um, so my father's mother died when he was a baby. And so my grandfather was a single parent for most of my dad's life. And they were not a wealthy family. Like my dad grew up in East London. They were evacuated during the war. And so he spent quite a bit of time out in the country when he was very small. But majority of the time he spent growing up in East London. And his dad was not one of those people who went for the kind of <laughs> criminal element, which was a bit more common around that area. His dad was a hardworking, respectful man who treated other people with courtesy and kindness. But he also expected other people to treat him with a certain level of respect, including his children. And there were consequences for doing the wrong thing. And this is a really great picture of what it means to be an authoritative parent, not authoritarian, authoritative. So there's different styles of parenting according to attachment theory. And there's only one style of parenting which is considered to be secure. All of the other styles of parenting lead to insecure attachments between parents and children. And that pattern of what the child sees as love, it's like a template for love. And it repeats throughout their life in their other interpersonal relationships, whether it's romantic or with their own children or with friends or with colleagues. So the reason why authoritative parenting is secure, the reason why it leads to a sense of security within the self and also an ability to create secure attachments with other people is because it teaches boundaries in a very kind and respectful way. So it's kind of like the sweet spot of parenting. It's dead in the middle. It's not one extreme of authoritarian, which is all about like, you shall obey me or I will like destroy you. And it's not this other type of parenting, which is extremely permissive and just allows people to get away with all kinds of evil. It is smack bang in the middle. And this is the style of parenting, which is essentially how God parents us. And one of the reasons why some people have trouble relating to God as the father figure is because they have had one of these extremes. They've either had someone who is extremely authoritarian, who just arbitrarily punished them for things that were out of their control, or they had someone who was extremely permissive and just allowed them to get away with blue murder. <laughs> like you can't have either of these situations. They're both toxic and they both lead to insecure attachment styles. So boundaries help us to create parameters around what is acceptable and what is not acceptable within a relationship. And so there's clear lines of delineation which cannot be crossed without problems occurring in the relationship and having to then address those problems. But within those parameters, within the fenced yard of your relationship, 
of what it is that you can and can't accept from other people, within that space is a whole bunch of freedom. And that is essentially what Jesus provides for us. He provides us the liberty to make our own choices and to do our own thing within the parameters of his boundaries. So there is autonomy and there is respect. But the thing is that that respect includes knowing where the lines are. The old saying of good fences make good neighbors very much applies to this situation. So having those clear lines around what is expected in terms of behavior from other people, that actually creates security for a child. So a child knows where the lines are and they know what the consequences are if they cross those lines. And it gives them the sense that someone else is in control, but still also shows them courtesy and respect. And this respectful, autonomous set of rules also teaches them how to navigate other relationships throughout their life. So when you encounter the extremes of this particular parenting uh, need, it, it is a need to have some rules, but to also have a sense of autonomy within those rules. If you have the authoritarian extreme at one end, it is extremely controlling and very, very toxic for someone's mental health. They feel like they have no bodily autonomy because essentially they don't. And then at the other extreme where you have this permissiveness where there like are no lines that you cannot cross. That also creates an insecure attachment because it's like fumbling around in the dark and you're just thinking, where is the line? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> so if a parent doesn't provide any boundaries and has no consequences for doing the wrong thing, that tends to produce a child that as an adult then starts to just trample over other people's boundaries because they have not been taught that they exist. And this is how you produce a narcissistic child. It's not necessarily that they were mistreated in any way, although not providing boundaries and rules for children is a form of neglect. But narcissism thrives in an environment where no one tells them no, where they can simply steamroll over another person in order to get their own way or perhaps manipulate whatever they want out of other people. If you have someone who was raised with an extremely controlling authoritarian parent and then you have someone who was raised with an extremely permissive parent and then those two people get together that's usually what's called codependent. <laughs> One person is used to being trampled over and controlled and the other person is used to just doing whatever they want with zero consequences and controlling someone else. <laughs> so they both kind of feel like something is wrong like something is missing or something is dysfunctional, but neither of them can really identify what the problem is. So why can't some people spot boundaries? Are they actually that oblivious? Well, attachment style is only one part of the puzzle. So it definitely teaches children whether there are boundaries or not, but one of the other, well, the other half of the puzzle is also identity. So in psychology, they generally consider personality to be fairly stable by the age of about seven. And the age of seven is also roughly when children start to really come into empathy. They really start to see that other people have their own world going on, that other people exist. 
However, after this kind of roughly a five year period of empathy, they come into the teen years and then it sort of regresses from there because during the teenage phase, the brain is once again restructuring itself. So it's pruning away different things. They are going through all sorts of hormonal changes and so they become extremely vulnerable <laughs> and they have this sense that everyone is looking at them. So there's two well-known cognitive distortions during the teenage years. One is the imaginary audience and the other one is called the personal fable. So the imaginary audience is when a teenager believes that everyone is hyper-focused on them, that everyone is looking at them, everyone is judging them, or conversely, everyone is admiring them. So a teenager will obsess about their looks. Uh, they will spend hours in front of the mirror looking at all the different spots on their face and just going, oh, everyone's going to see it. Everyone's going to be judging me on this. I must be perfect. Or they will make a dumb mistake or say something really stupid in class. And then they're just unable to laugh it off because it's like this feeling of death that comes over them. The, uh, the social shame that teenagers feel is essentially down to this imaginary audience. And eventually at some point, hopefully, <laughs> teenagers start to learn that no one really notices them that much. That most other people are very preoccupied with their own lives, that they've got a lot going on and they're just oblivious to the teenager. And then when the teenager has that epiphany, when they have that breakthrough, then they're like, oh, I don't have to obsess over my looks. But of course, in the age of social media, that message tends to become quite reinforced, that people are looking at them, that people are judging them, and that they need to be admired rather than criticized. So any kind of criticism feels like death and they have to chase affirmation from other people. So they're deriving their sense of worth from external sources rather than from internal sources. So the self-esteem will be artificially inflated by this external validation, or it could just be completely flattened in two seconds. Now the personal fable is kind of an extension of the imaginary audience. And it's the sense that their life is so noteworthy that it should be written down in some epic saga and told for countless generations. And this particular cognitive distortion can lead to all kinds of reckless behavior where someone is attempting to be larger than life. So they will do really dangerous things because they feel invincible. Once again, most teenagers grow out of this, especially as their prefrontal cortex develops. Although the prefrontal cortex has not finished developing until around the age of 25. But during this phase, they will be very much subject to extreme highs and extreme lows of emotion and mood. So if they get positive feedback, their elation will just be through the roof. And if they get negative feedback, they will be so depressed that they just want to die. If this sort of thing persists into adulthood, it could be a symptom of bipolar or perhaps a personality disorder like borderline. So they kind of need to stabilize their moods and generally just be content with being ordinary. The other thing that is going on during the teenage years is Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. And the teenage phase is seen as identity versus role confusion. So Erickson's theory of psychosocial development has various different phases throughout life. And 
it's not really like set in stone that these phases are only restricted to certain periods, but they do tend to be like the majority is associated with like this period for this phase or figuring stuff out. So the teenage years are generally considered to be about figuring out who you are and what it is that you want to do with your life. And so during this phase, you'll often see teenagers kind of trying on different identities. So if you think of all of the different uh, cliques in like high school, you might have, you know, the jocks or the geeks or the emos, all these different identity groups. So these identity groups tend to have fairly strict dress codes and also like hobbies and the types of music that they listen to. And it's a way for teenagers to figure out who they are and who they want to be. But of course, it's kind of unhealthy to subscribe too strongly to a very rigid identity group. That's kind of like a cult. And that's why people who are in their teen years or in their early 20s are usually the most vulnerable for joining cults, but not necessarily the only people. Like you can be vulnerable to that later on if you don't have a firm sense of your own self, if you haven't fully formed your own identity. So identity can change a little bit over time as we grow as we learn different things, as we have different experiences, our identity should in essence kind of evolve, but at the same time, there should be a core sense of self. Like it wouldn't change so substantially that the person becomes unrecognizable to people who knew them like 10 or 20 years ago. However, if someone's identity is so unstable that it is easily influenced by other people and by popular culture and by different identity groups, then that is a sign that this person missed this particular phase of development. This person is suffering from role confusion. So they don't really know what their values are. They don't really know who they are at their core, what they are capable of, what they are able to do. They don't have a clear sense of direction as to where they're going in life. So they will be very shallow, very fickle and quite unstable. And so you might notice that people who don't understand boundaries, who have trouble identifying boundaries, they tend to be overgrown teenagers. Like they are terrible at being adults. <laughs> they really can't deal with it. And so they tend to try and find other people who can be the adult for them. <laughs> so they will generally latch onto someone who is very stable or someone who is very mature and try to get that person to do all of the hard, difficult life stuff for them. <laughs> so that's one of their coping mechanisms, but they do have a few other coping mechanisms which are to do with their sense of identity. Number one is subsuming other people's stories and identities into themselves as though it happened to them and character traits of another person belong to them. So think of the quintessential fan fiction teenager. You know how teenagers get very obsessed with different stories? Uh, for example, like people who are totally into Harry Potter or people who are very into Twilight and then they make their whole life about fictitious worlds and fictitious characters. This sense of being overly invested in someone else's story can also manifest in the real world. So these people might be extremely invested in your stories and they start to take on your personal experiences as though they are their own. And that's why these people tend to talk about someone else's life in very inappropriate ways when it's like none of their business because they have actually identified it as part of their own story. Like if you were to ask them if they understood the difference between themselves and another person, they would say, yes, they do. 
And yet, they overshare someone else's story to people who do not know this person. So you'll often find that if you tell them things about your life, they will react to it in very exaggerated ways. They will either be like giddy and delighted in your story, or they will be devastated and so upset about your story. <laughs> and in the same way that a teenager indulges in a lot of fan fiction, the fan fiction tends to be about things like either being that person or being in a relationship with that person. And so they have this very immersive and rich fantasy life to do with other people or fictitious characters. And that's why these people can sometimes imagine that they are in a relationship with you or if they're friends with you, they can imagine that they are you. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. The second aspect is trying to control other people's behavior and choices. So this is kind of like the extension of investing very heavily in someone else's stories. So because they have personalized another person's life, they think that they have some say in it, that they should have control of it. So instead of seeing themselves as a separate human being with their own stories and their own identity, they take on the identities of other people and the stories of other people. And then they believe wholeheartedly, this is not like a conscious nefarious thing where they're like, ha ha ha, I'm going to control this other person. No, it's, they literally feel like your life is their life. And that's why they believe that they need control of it. The distinction between themselves and other people is so permanently blurred that they do not know where they end and other people begin. So they really don't understand that there's anything wrong with interfering in other people's lives, with trying to like impose their opinions onto other people by like saying, you should do this, you should do that. You should go here, go there, like quite forcefully telling people what to do. And they really don't get the subtle social cues when you say, no thanks, I'm going to do my own thing. They're like, no, 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 you should do this. You should do that. And it's like, no, I'm fine, thanks. And they're like, oh, but this, but that, but the other. And then you actually have to become rude and say, but out of my life. And then at that point, they're extremely offended. They're like, oh, oh but that's because they did not see it coming. They could not read the signs. They had no idea that you felt imposed upon because they don't see it as an imposition. They see it as their right. They have a right to you. They are supposed to be controlling you because it's basically like the same as bodily autonomy. <laughs> so they will make decisions on your behalf even when you actually ask them not to. So if you say, I don't want to do this, I don't want to spend my money on that, I don't want to let this person move into my house, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, they just go ahead and do it anyway. They essentially don't even hear you. They will begin to appropriate your time, appropriate your money, appropriate your attention. So they will be really upset if you don't text them back immediately. And they'll be like, why aren't you texting me? Respond now. And again, it's because they don't see a separation between you and them. You're not a separate person. You are part of them. So your money is their money in the same way that their money is their money. Your time is their time in the same way that their time is their time. This grandiose entitlement is not conscious. It's literally who they are. And even more difficult is that they often see this interference and this controlling of you as benevolent. They think they are doing you a favor. So are there examples of this in the Bible? 
Well, yes, there is. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone else's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. For if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. In psychology and counselling training, it's very much explained that the therapist is not there to tell their clients what to do or how to live their life. Because the therapist, at the end of the day, they might be full of all sorts of great ideas, but they are not the ones who have to live with the consequences of those choices. The client is the person who has to make the decisions for themselves. They have to figure out what works best for their own life, what they are capable of doing, what they are comfortable with doing, and what is feasible for them to do. And so the therapist might disagree with that. The therapist might think that the client is being weak or ineffective or whatever, but it's not up to the therapist. It's up to the person who has to live those consequences. And that's the other thing about God. He's not going to live your life for you. He's going to let you do your own thing. He is there if you want guidance and wisdom and some counsel, but he cannot make those choices for you. You have free will, which he granted to you because that's love. Love is not controlling. Love does not take over someone else's life in this misguided benevolence. That's a wrong definition of love. And in counseling, it is also very much known that if you try and take over your client's life, if you try and tell them what to do step by step, you kind of create a dependency. So the other person has to keep coming back to you in order to find out what the next step is in this plan that they did not come up with themselves because they don't know where this is going. So in many respects, God is laying out a path for us, but that's because he's God. He actually knows what the future is. He knows all of the moving parts in this particular world and in all of these people. But if you're a separate human being, you don't know what all the moving parts are. You don't know what the future holds. You cannot advise someone on the best course of action all the time. So if you try and appoint yourself the decision maker in someone else's life, you are essentially taking the role of God for one thing, which is terrible, but also you don't have to live with the consequences. The other person has to live with it. And so people who don't understand boundaries, they also don't understand it when you later on complain that the choices that they made on your behalf without consulting you or against your wishes they don't understand why you're complaining. They're like, I did an awesome thing for you because I am your God. So how exactly are you supposed to deal with someone who does not perceive your boundaries and who consistently walks over them even when you tell them that there is a boundary there and that you do not wish them to do X, Y, Z or interfere in this or meddle in that? Well. 
This person unfortunately did not get that feedback from their parents when they were young. So in an extremely permissive attachment style, they were not given negative feedback. All of their toxic behavior was positively reinforced. So unfortunately, they now have to either suffer the consequences of it as an adult, which is of course extremely difficult to deal with, or they can spend the rest of their lives avoiding it and just trying to steamroll every single person that they come across and forcing them to put up with their behavior. But according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the only way that they learn from this is through social shaming. Basically have nothing to do with them. Don't necessarily treat them like an enemy, but admonish them as a brother. Basically this person did not have the right family environment growing up. So the church is supposed to provide that family environment so that they can relearn what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And unfortunately, the only way that they are going to learn is through experiencing the pain of that social shame and hopefully never wanting to experience that pain again. In the same way that these people should not be attempting to control you, Likewise, you cannot expect to change their behavior. You can only choose to distance yourself from their toxicity in the hopes they realize the effect their behavior has on their relationships. You're not really doing them a service if you prevent them from experiencing the consequences of their actions. You're actually essentially stunting their growth and leaving them in this perpetual adolescent state. And then what you get at the end is a childish adult, someone who has never grown up, you know, the whole Peter Pan complex. Resilience is a muscle and it only develops through encountering obstacles and overcoming them. How are you supposed to learn how to problem solve if you never have a problem to solve? So if the church is not providing that adversity for this person to figure out and to problem solve, then they are just going to stay in their perpetual state of immaturity. The church needs to become the family that provides tough love, the sort of family that everyone should have growing up. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have your own experiences or things that you want to add, leave that in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new and I will catch up with you later. Bye.